I got a little bit deeper into this and thought about a spinning globe, 666, and a strong delusion. In my Babylon Rising series, I pointed out some correlations to Nimrod. Nimrod ben Cush, when you do Nimrod ben Cush, the, the numerical value of that is 666. There are lots of other things uh, in his incarnation as Gilgamesh, he was said to be one-third man and two-thirds God. One-third man, well, man is a carbon-based organism, which carbon consists of six protons, six electrons, six neutrons, and two-thirds God, well, two-thirds equals 66.6%, interesting. Things like the Washington Monument, when you look at obelisks, you guys have one, went and checked it out today. Uh, everybody's got them. Uh, it's a phallic symbol. It goes back to the Osiris myth and all that stuff. We've got the largest phallic symbol in the world in Washington, D.C., uh, and the Washington Monument, which stands at 6,666 inches tall by 666 inches wide. 666 all over the place. Well, when I started to think about Apollo's phallic symbol <laughs> and the Apollo program, and I'm looking at the dates and everything, July 7th, 1969, the gematria of that, if you're familiar with how that works, uh, distills down to the number seven. Seven is often the number associated with God or deity. Seven, which God? Well, Apollo. And you have 720 distilling to nine, and you have 911. Again, there's a whole lot that can be, a whole seminar that can be done just on the, the significance and why the occult loves the number 911. And of course, if you're familiar with what happened in the United States on 9-11, you know, lots of stuff to talk about there. What intrigues me most about the Apollo 11 mission was this was the one that accomplished the lofty goal of landing a man on the moon. And all of the symbolism in this particular uh, mission points right back to Nimrod stuff. Revelation 9-11, right? We see the name of the beast, Apollo, Apollyon. He's the Antichrist. Uh, now, there are some really interesting correlations between the numbers 9 and 11, Scripture and this particular mission of Apollo. For instance, some have linked the 9, if you don't know what the 9 is, do a Google on the 9, to the Aeneid of Egypt. The Aeneid were the nine great gods, of the Atum, the, the Atum Shu, Tefnut, Gub, uh, Geb, Nut, Nephthys, who is the sister of Isis, Auser, another name for Osiris, Set, his brother, and Aset, a derivative name for Isis. The latter four, of course, as I mentioned before, is the acronym for NASA. If this link is indeed a solid one, <laughs> there are ancient legends that speak of the Zeptepi, the first time. And that was the age uh, that the Egyptians referred to as a time when the sky gods came down to earth, raising the land from the water. They came in flying boats and brought wisdom to mankind through the bloodlines of the pharaohs. Gods in flying boats? NASA? Apollo spaceship? Eh, maybe it's all just a coincidence. Um, the eagle. The eagle, uh, Manly P. Hall, says that when you see an eagle with a point on the back of its head, like on the back of your dollar bill and on the great seal, he said, nah, that's not, we, we put a fast one on you. That's a stylized, conventionalized phoenix. Well, the, the phoenix goes back to the Egyptian Banu. The Banu was the soul bird of Osiris. And so you've got this, This okay, let me kind of pull it all together. If Ishtar, Semiramis, Isis are one and the same, Columbia, and Osiris and Apollo and Nimrod are one and the same, then what you have is Columbia orbiting above and the eagle carrying Apollo landing on the moon. I mean, it's like all going right directly back to this whole uh, Osiris, Horus, Isis, Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz, it, it, all of it's there. Okay, so we've already established that Nimrod is the beast, the Antichrist. We know that 666 is the number of the beast. Now, check this out. When you start looking at the spinning heliocentric globe, 666 keeps popping up. Speed of Earth's orbit. If you look it up, uh, it'll either tell you in kilometers or miles per second. When I looked it up, uh, it was kilometers, converted it to miles, and saw that it was 18.5 miles per second. Well, you multiply that times 60 seconds to get minutes, 60 minutes to get an hour, it's 66,600 miles an hour. That's how fast the Earth is supposedly going around the sun. Curvature of the Earth. When you do the math to figure out how much the Earth is curving, 25,000 miles circumference ball, using the Pythagorean the theorem, you end up with eight inches per mile squared, which is the first mile is eight inches. The curvature is eight inches in one mile. Eight inches is 0.666 of a foot. 
10 miles is 66.666 feet. 100 miles, 6,666.666 feet. Starting to see a pattern here. <laughs> Earth's tilt, look it up, 23.4 degrees, 23.4 off of center. Well, 90 degrees, right? 90 subtract 23.4, 66.6. Is it just a coincidence that so many of the numbers related to our spinning heliocentric ball just so happen to be associated with the beast? I started to think about the great deception, the great delusion. Scripture talks about there's going to be a, such a great deception that's going to come in the end times. Who brings the great deception? Do you know? That's right. God does. Many people uh, think that it comes from Satan. Now, I think Satan certainly capitalizes on it, no doubt, but it comes from the Father. Why? Well, Scripture tells us why. Second, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming of the lawless one, who is the beast, who is the Antichrist, will be accompanied by the power of Satan. He will use every kind of power, including miraculous signs, lying wonders, and every type of evil to deceive those who are dying, those who refuse to love the truth that would save them. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Then all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in unrighteousness will be condemned. He sends the delusion because people would rather live in lawlessness. They would rather follow the beast. When I started getting into Torah and understanding Torah and reading like Deuteronomy in chapter 12 in particular, where he specifically says, do not learn the ways of the heathen. Do not worship me the way the heathens worship their gods. Like <coughs> Christmas, <coughs> Easter. Things that I used to love. I used to write, direct, or play Jesus in passion plays on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Christmas plays. I was a mall Santa. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> yep. Of course, I needed a lot of fat pads, pads to make that work. I loved all that stuff. But when I, it doesn't take but 10 minutes to do a Google search on the pagan origins of Christmas and Easter to realize what in the world are we associating this filth with the God that we say we believe that is a holy and righteous God, holy God. He says, don't do it. This whole idea of Christianizing paganism is foreign to God. It didn't work out for the Israelites. Read about the golden calf. They said, we are doing this as a feast to yod heh vav -Hey. They said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. But they associated it with yod heh vav -Hey, Yahuwah. So their, you know my heart, their heart was to worship the God that brought them out of Egypt, and they identified tomorrow we will have a feast unto yod heh vav -Hey with this golden calf. How'd that work out? 3,000 dead. God doesn't like that stuff. Now, I think that he gives us a pass when we do things in ignorance. Sorry you guys attended this seminar. You're not in ignorance anymore. You can't make that claim anymore. You can reject it. You can say that I'm crazy, but I just shared with you the truth. You can look it up for yourself. You know, And all of that stuff, when you start tracing those things back, they end up going back to Nimrod, the man of sin, the lawless one, the beast. And if God says, if you're not going to listen to the truth, if you'd rather follow in the ways of the, uh, the, the lawless one, fine, I'll give you a great delusion. Could this be it, what I've been talking about this evening? I don't know. It seems like a really good fit to me, though, especially with all the associations that add up to 666. Hello, McFly. Right? I don't know that it is or not. But I'll tell you this, the responses that I have received from people have shocked me. It's one thing for somebody to say something and you disagree with them. It's another to go completely psycho when you do. And people that I have talked to who are otherwise very friendly, passive, pastoral, you know, nice people have gone literally insane in front of me, getting very angry. And that's what said to me, I'm going, man, there must be a spiritual component to this particular subject for people like that, that I would never in a million years imagine to get so upset to react the way they did. Again, I don't know that this is it or not, but it sure is adding up to, yeah, I think it could be, especially with all those scriptures that I showed you and for the sake of time, we didn't have time to drill into all of it. 
But I showed you all the scriptures that describe this place, and there is not a single scripture you can use that even remotely supports a spinning heliocentric globular Earth in an ever-expanding universe. And I'll go back to the trump card for me was all the stars are falling to this place, to Earth. Somebody's lying. For me, it became a matter of faith. I still have questions. You know, you guys maybe ask me questions. We have some time here. I probably don't have the answers to them. I got, many, I got more questions than I have answers. And there's things that, some things I think I figured out, and there's many more that I haven't figured out. And there's always a yeah, but for whatever you do figure out. So I just, you know, if we're in a sea of lies, the only compass I have is the word of God. And it has never failed me. I'm 47 years old. Not once has it ever failed me. And it has taken me through some very difficult times. And is God a man that he should lie? No. And it says that he esteems his word above his own name. And when you read how much he wants his name to be known, that's saying something. He wants his name known in all the world, not substituted with a title, the Lord. That's not his name. He wants his name known, but he esteems his word above his name. So I've just taken a position. I'm like, okay, Lord, that's what your word says. I'm going to accept it. You know, come what may. And when I started to weigh the differences, I'm going, wait a minute, science or the Bible? Science says the universe came about from a big bang. The Bible says all in one universe, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science says that the stars, including our sun, came first. The Bible says the sun and stars didn't show up until day four after the earth was created and already producing life. Science describes solar systems with planets going around a fixed sun. The Bible describes an earth-based system with the sun, moon, and stars moving over it. Science says the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour and orbiting the sun at nearly 67,000 miles per hour. The Bible says in, nearly 60, or in about 67 places that the sun, moon, and stars are moving, but never says anything about the earth moving. Rather, we consistently find that the earth is fixed and unmovable, set on a firm foundation of pillars. Science tells us the universe came into being nearly 14 billion years ago and that the earth is about 4.5 billion years old. The Bible tells us it all began less than 6,000 years ago. Science tells us that humans arrived on this earth, as Kent Hoban would say, from goo to you by way of the zoo. The Bible says that we were divinely created in the image and likeness of Yahuwah. Science tells us we are on a spinning heliocentric globe in an average galaxy among billions of galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. The Bible, Bible tells us we are on a still flat earth that was inscribed as a circle into something with four corners set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four of creation. So who should we believe, science or the Bible? I know my answer. You guys are going to have to figure out your own answer. Just remember, whatever you come up with, belief is absurd. <laughs> whatever your belief is, it's going to be absurd to somebody else. Here's where I would conclude this weekend. Um, if, you know, I said at the beginning of this, if you haven't done any investigation, you have no right to condemn Condemnation before investigation is the height of ignorance. So if you're going to condemn me and you haven't done any investigation, I'm just going to be amazed at how high you've scaled the mountain of ignorance while you're throwing rocks at me. And I would say, start with the Bible. I've given you a good place to start with some of the stuff I shared here today. But then here's some other books that I highly recommend you check out. Zetetic Astronomy, written in 1865 by Dr. Samuel Robinum. 100 Proofs, Earth's Not a Globe, by William Carpenter, 1885. Terra firma is probably my favorite of those three. Uh, the Earth, terra firma, the Earth not a planet, proved from scripture, reason, and fact by David Wardlaw Scott, written in 1901. I did a radio interview uh, for a uh, radio show in Russia, not related to any of this stuff, um, and it was all through translation. And when it was over, the translator asked me if I could stay on the line for a little while longer. I said, sure. She said, you know, I gotta tell you something. I've been following your other stuff that you've been doing on the flat Earth. She said, Flat Earth was taught in our secular schools in Russia as recent as 1917. Not too long after that, a guy named, um, I forget his first name, Picard was his last name, I think, um, got in basically a hot air weather balloon type thing, built a metal thing for himself to go in it. He's the first guy to go up into the stratosphere. I think it was in 1930, 1931. Came back, described this place as flat, as a big flat disk. And it's in Popular Science magazine in the 1930s. Once again, Professor Pika. Download a free audio book with your 30-day trial.
8 Ball Pool with over 10 million daily players on your smartphone or tablet. Mika, the Belgian scientist, has ascended to heights never before reached by man to study the stratosphere, that unknown region which surrounds the Earth at a distance of more than seven miles. Last year in May, he reached over nine miles in height, but this time he was out to beat his own record. Accompanied by his assistant, Monsieur Max Cousins, the start was made at dawn from Dubendorf Aerodrome near Zurich. The preparations for the flight began at midnight, but thousands of people had made the journey from Zurich in special trains, whilst a battalion of Swiss troops held down the guy ropes. Professor Picard himself superintended the arrangements for the inflation of the balloon. And then, when all was ready, he clambered inside the gondola, which contained a mass of scientific instruments, and gave the signal to let go. The balloon rose quickly and eventually climbed to over ten and a half miles above the Earth. Just imagine, whilst we were sweltering in the heat wave, he was nearly frozen to death in 15 degrees centigrade below zero. After being aloft for over 12 hours, he eventually landed near Lake Garda in Italy. From the practical point of view, Professor Picard's experiment is of the highest possible importance. But one of the things it will definitely do will be to enable better weather forecasts to be made. We were on the scene as soon as the Austrian Alpine troops you now see on their way to the glacier to recover the envelope and gondola in which the intrepid professors had made a perfect landing. After their amazing air voyage, just imagine, twice as high as Mount Everest, the biggest mountain in the world. Now here's uh, some pictures, August Picard, PhD in physics. Uh, this is well-known historic figure, I mean stamps of him, I mean he's, uh, this is not some guy, I can't believe how I never heard of him. Here's him in the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, says he was, uh, he died in 19, he was born in 1884, died in 1962, Swiss-born Belgian physicist, notable for his exploration of both the upper stratosphere and the depths of the sea and shifts uh, of his own design. In 1930, he built a balloon to the study cosmic rays. In 1932, he developed a new cabin designed for balloon flights. In the same year, he ascended to 17,008 meters, 55,800 feet, completed. Uh, another one he did it later on. Um, he was born into a family of Swiss scholars. Um, I, you know, it worked with, like I said, he worked with Albert Einstein. Here's a picture of him with his assistant in the capsule and, that they went up in, and it had portholes, and this is a porthole. Um, and then I found this. It, this is a popular science magazine from August 1931. He did this in May. So just a few months after his ascent to a world record height, um, there was an article in there, 10 miles high in an airtight balloon. Now, just so people could say that, that, that I didn't get this off the internet, I did a little research. So I went on eBay and searched for Popular Science Magazine, 1931, August edition. I found one. I paid $15 for this. It was 25 cents in 1931. Just to verify this fact, and I'm going to read this article to you. This is the testimony of a physicist, scientist, engineer, the first man to reach the stratosphere that height. His testimony of the shape of the earth. Can I read this to you? Uh -huh. It's on page 23. This blew my mind, didn't this? Just to verify, is that the same order? Mm -hmm. If I was in court, this would be exhibit one, <laughs> right? It says a huge yellow balloon soared skyward a few weeks ago from Augsburg, Germany. Instead of a basket, it trailed an airtight black and silver aluminum ball. Within, Professor August Picard, physicist, and Charles Kepfer aimed to explore the air 50,000 feet up. 17 hours later, after being given up for dead, they returned safely from an estimated height 
of more than 52,000 feet, almost 10 miles, shattering every aircraft altitude record. Oxygen tanks kept them alive while they made observations. Uh, records of their instruments are now being checked and interpreted first. The uh, first to rise safely into the upper layer of the Earth's stratosphere, they found the air pressure at 10 miles altitude so low, one-tenth of that at sea level, that a man exposed to it would perish, much as a deep fish would uh, a deep fish, a deep sea fish burst of its own internal pressure when it's brought to the Earth's surface. Picard and his aide found cosmic rays, mysterious radiations from outer space. They thought, of course, far more powerful than the Earth's surface and engaged uh, their intensity. The explorers trapped samples of upper air, blue air, as Picard reported it to appear in cylinders. Analysis may prove it exceptionally rich in ozone. The intense blue gas supposedly uh, responsible for the heavy side layer uh, or radio roof. Now listen to this. The story of their adventure surpasses fiction. During the ascent, the aluminum ball began to leak. They plugged it desperately with Vaseline and cotton waste, stopping the leak. In the first half hour, the balloon shot up nine miles through, and through portholes, the observers saw the earth through copper-colored, then bluish haze. Here's what he said. It seemed a flat disc with upturned edge. Now this is 1931, before NASA, before they decided they were gonna lie to us, before they conspired worldwide to lie. And it's not too long after that, you got World War II and all that, and then we have the Admiral Byrd, all the weird stuff I showed you, nuclear bomb testings and all that, and then everything starts to change. Just something to consider. The most recent book that I've seen that has come out that I really enjoyed was The Greatest Lie on Earth by Edward Hendry. Read these books, that's just the beginning of your journey of investigation. And you can also check out more for more information. You could go to testingtheglobe.com or check out our product table. Thank you guys very much. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.